Welcome back. Uh, we just completed our discussion on photolithography and according to the content or uh, the syllabus of this particular course, we will now move on to soft lithography. Maybe this is another term that uh, is going to be new to many of you, uh, but we will slowly learn and I am sure uh, you will appreciate that you are learning something new because this is not what we have been discussing, we have been discussing is not something that is very routinely covered in the undergraduate curriculum what you have uh, studied so far. So, uh, we are approaching also roughly the midway stage. So, it is not a bad idea to recapitulate the team. Uh, you are quite well conversant with me and my face by now, but if you want to sort of drop me a mail, here is my mail id. However, any discussion related to the course, I will prefer to take it at the discussion forum and not in a personal mail. Uh, you can find out my home page by best option is to key in my name and uh, you can uh, just the first search will take you to my home page. Also for one of the reasons, one more reason you might have to search uh, the internet and that is if I, if you want to use the NPTEL resources that we already have for my course thin film instability patterning and instability of thin polymer films, which covers large part of what we have been discussing here. You can go to YouTube straight away and uh, find out them, find them out. Of course, you can also find them in the first slide, first lecture I have given you the numbers, course numbers in NPTEL website, which also you can use. Uh, TAs will be Nandini Bhandaru and Anuja Das and they will be replying to most of your questions in the discussion forum, but I will also be online and I am online and I will be checking what is going on. So, moving on, I am assuming that we have now all understood photolithography at least in its basic form and let us try to find out uh, why we need some additional techniques or soft lithography. One of the motivation of course, is if you look very carefully is photolithography is a technique that is sort of optimized for the microelectronic or the IC industry, right. But when we were initially discussing about some of the patterning technique uh, patterning applications, you have seen that apart from microelectronics, there are host of other areas like structural hydro fabrication of hydrophobic surfaces or self cleaning surfaces or let us say structural color, many other applications template for biotechnological applications, where you need patterned surfaces, but you really do not need to go all the way down to their doping or you do not really always need the structures to be in a photoresist layer. So, is photolithography uh, necessary in those stages or should, should we concentrate with some techniques that are compatible or that are more versatile that can handle different types of materials rather than sticking only to photolithography. In fact, there are quite a few though photolithography is sort of an extremely dominant, uh, extremely important technique. There are in fact, a few limitations of photolithography and let us take a quick look into some of those. The most important thing that you should immediately and you should in fact, help me or sort of prompt me what had it been a class I would have made you prompt. Most important thing first that should come to your mind is photolithography as a technique can pattern only a photoresist layer. Uh, if you need structures which may be in other polymers or other soft materials like gel uh, or let us say even inorganic soft materials, some inorganic materials can be processed through the so through a soft route and that falls into a very well known area of research, the sol gel uh, based techniques. Uh, these type of materials photolithography as it is cannot handle. Requires very harsh processing condition and therefore, uh, pattern surfaces uh, actually find application in lot of nanobiotic applications. So, leaving cells and things like that, which cannot sustain the harsh processing condition of an UV exposure. Not to mention that if you uh, sort of go all the way down to removal of the barrier layer you use uh, extremely harsh agent in the form of hydrogen fluoride or plasma. Of course, there is a resolution limitation uh, due to the diffraction and the wavelength of optical source and uh, though there are, uh, I am sure most of you are well conversant with this factor now, uh, though there are methods to circumvent these problems in the form of let us say projection lithography or immersion lithography, it is still very cumbersome, very, very cumbersome. Uh, Certain thing I almost we none of us almost discussed or realized is that photolithography, since it uses a spin coating platform, it cannot handle patterns on a non planar surface. 
Of course, you do not need patents on non-planar surfaces uh, for the IC, electri IC industry, but you think of, so it cannot, neither it can handle non-planar surfaces, nor can it handle flexible surfaces. But say now you have display devices which are not even big TVs, which are not perfectly plain. They are, uh, they have curvature for better or enhanced viewing comfort. You have flexible display like you can fold your display and stuff like that and photolithography fails in, in all of them, right. And of course, it requires extensive infrastructure, right, like a yellow room, uh, mask aligner, etcetera, which we have already talked. Now, all these very stringent requirements are perfectly okay for the IC industry, where uh, sort of pattern fidelity and uh, numbers of defects, I mean the structures should be absolutely defect free in order for having a desired performance, because a one single defect on a chip is going to spoil the whole chip. But there are host of bulk nano segments as we can call, I mean where you need nanoscale structures, but the well the requirement is not so, the, the require requirement of the defect free nature is not so uh, strong. You can have some defects here and there, but you need to have these structures at a much lower cost. Huh? So, there is a huge segment. For example, the self cleaning coatings you want to have. You really cannot spend money for coating some windows uh, for the type of money you spend for buying a consumer durable microelectronic uh, device. So, there has to be some alternative route for catering to this bulk nano fabrication seg segment, where patterns can be uh, sort of reproduced easily without so much extensive infrastructure and more importantly they can handle variety of materials. So, generically uh, soft materials or materials that can be handled in the soft form can be handled by them and they are not limited to some photosensitive material like photolithography. So, all these considerations gave rise to a group of techniques gave led to the development of a group of techniques which goes by the name soft lithography. In fact, another important thing that you must realize at this point of time is photolithography refers to a very specific technique, very specific set of technique. There might be certain variations here and there like you can have a positive or photo negative photoresist, but overall or you can towards the end you can either have etching or lift off, but overall photolithography is a very well defined technique, very, very well defined technique. In contrast, soft lithography as it is is no technique at all. It is a suit of different techniques that are capable of uh, hand or patterning different types of soft materials, which includes polymers, which includes elastomers, gels, uh, sole gel films, even colloids and stuff like that. Uh, pioneering development in this area was primarily done exactly about 20 years back by Professor G. M. Whitesides. Uh, he was at uh, Harvard. And uh, so, he and one of his graduate students at that point of time, Jia, uh, they are the two key players who develop most of the techniques. Some techniques as you will realize that uh, some techniques have been developed later, but almost simultaneously Stephen Chow initially at Minnesota and then eventually he moved on to Princeton came up with another technique which goes by the name nano imprint lithography. Uh, there is a debate and as we will see from the classification whether nano imprint lithography should be considered into the soft lithography technique or not, because there are arguments in favor and arguments against. One of the key reasons why uh, people feel that it is not a part of a soft lithography method is of course, it was not invented. Soft lithography is a, is a technique that was, is a phrase that was coined by uh, Whiteside's group, but uh, NIL had a uh, different uh, uh, genesis and uh, there are some issues. but. Uh, the way we will or I visualize this, I prefer to include nano imprint lithography as one of the soft lithography techniques. Why this discrimination comes, we will discuss when we talk about classification of soft lithography. And as I already hinted, soft lithography obviously covers lot of different techniques. Uh, I must also say that each of the technique has their own advantages and certain unique features. Also, let me uh, sort of give you a subtle warning that there are too many names available in the soft lithography literature. So, anybody who has developed some technique has sort of filed a patent with a specific name. Some of them are uh, genuinely new, but some of them are essentially extensions of existing techniques. So, it is not possible 
uh, for anyone forget about a condensed course like this in which to talk about or even to identify all soft lithography methods what are which are there. But what I have tried to do is I have tried to pick up some of the key techniques. These are sort of the pioneering techniques initially developed and uh, extensively practiced now. And these techniques as you will realize each one of these techniques we will be discussing have certain specific uh, capability which none of the other techniques can. So, based with this introduction let us move on in understanding uh, soft lithography in some greater detail. So, as I have already told the soft lithography are sort of a group of techniques that are specific for soft surfaces like polymers and gels. Uh, particularly for applications which do not require extremely stringent quality control. Uh, several application areas where large area nano and meso scale structures are necessary, uh, but even if there are defects here and there it is okay. And more importantly there is absolutely no need why these structures should be on uh, photo resist. So, you in fact want the patterns. on other materials. And that is a capability that is severely limited in uh, uh, classical uh, photo in photolithography not even classical. Let me just quickly highlight the key points. So, capability of handling soft materials generically. Well, uh, and then uh, as we will see that its capability also includes uh, patterning of let us say non planar surfaces. flexible surfaces and also uh, situations where processing condition is very gentle you tend to rely more on uh, there are techniques which tends to rely more on let us say uh, subtle forces like the capillary force or the van der Waals force and are not really on uh, brute force ex externally applied high pressure, which also is there certain techniques also rely on that or let us say UV exposure and things like that. So, you can in principle pattern biological samples, living cells everything by soft lithography. Moving on, uh, these are advantages we already discussed convenient, rapid, inexpensive. Uh, also, another another very very important issue in soft lithography is there is diffraction limitation. Yeah, way back in 1997 I think 10 nanometer lateral resolution was achieved and uh, I think by 2001 or 2002 by nano imprint lithography 5 nanometer lateral resolution has been achieved. So, that is a big advantage there are disadvantages or but that disadvantage is also there in photolithography. Uh, if you think very carefully photolithography is not a primary patterning technique. What I mean by this prime this word primary patterning technique is photolithography as a method cannot create its own pattern. It is capable of only reproducing the pattern that is drawn on the mask. So, the original pattern actually is created on the mask by whichever technique you make the mask that is a primary patterning technique. And we briefly mentioned in the last class about this next generation lithography techniques like focused ion beam, electron beam lithography etcetera, which are primarily the, the which are the ones we can which, which, which sort of can write a pattern. So, very similar to that you will also realize sim very similar to photolithography. Soft lithography is a parallel processing technique. Para, uh, so, however, it is not a patterning technique. So, it requires just the way photolithography requires a mask, soft lithography requires a stamp, mold or a master. In fact, this these three words sort of 
uh, are interchangeably used one can say in soft lithography literature. Uh, some techniques sort of specifically refer to the same thing with a specific name. For example, nano imprint lithography will always refer to the stamp as the mold, but they serve the same purpose. This is where the original pattern is engraved and soft lithography is sort of a very rapid Xerox machine. It goes on producing replicas of this structure. In principle, photolithography also does the same thing, but it is a much more cumbersome uh, technique and you use the, uh, the, the uh, photo sensitive property of the photo resist to achieve that. Uh, before I move on further, uh, we need to sort of uh, have a very quick and this is not a course on polymer physics. So, these are issues that I have uh, completely avoided in fact, uh, but I think we, we sort of need a bit of this discussion is a quick uh, classification of the basic types of polymers. And it turns out that uh, one can divide the polymers into two categories. Most of you will agree that uh, polymers are, uh, most of you know that most of the polymers are amorphous material. There are uh, certain rare examples of a semi crystalline polymer, but those are special cases and we are not talking about those type of complicated stuff. So, one can sort of distinguish polymers as glassy polymer or the so called thermoplastics and the cross link polymers or the so called thermosets. So, these glassy polymers are long chain entanglement entangled polymers and there are no physical cross links between the chain, but they can remain entangled. So, it is essentially when we talk about uh, in the context of surface and uh, tension the different components, these are ideal candidates where you in fact have a, a strong uh, effect of the steric interactions, right. Though in order to keep things simple, we did not talk about the mathematical expression of steric interactions, but we all understand that steric interactions are there, they, they are important. So, and these are essentially the classic examples. Uh, one can also say that uh, higher is the molecular weight of these polymers, longer are going to be their chain lengths, higher is going to be the steric interaction and that is manifested in terms of higher viscosity. Uh, Many of these polymers including for example, the cover of this pen uh, or many co many components you see in our daily life, they are plastic made, but they behave like solid at room temperature. And how is it possible? It is the fact is that these polymers have, there is a specific property of a polymer uh, that is called the glass transition temperature. Uh, below that their viscosity is extremely high. So, the polymers do not, the material does not flow and it behaves like a solid. Uh, so, that comes the thing that T g of this polymer is an important property and above T g all we need to understand that there is a sudden drop in viscosity. The, so, the viscosity, so if you sort of heat up a polymer slowly and you record its viscosity, you will see a plot like this. And I do not think I need to tell anything more, so you people are quite knowledgeable by now. So, this is the temperature which corresponds to the glass transition temperature. Right. So, this is a T g and from our standpoint the only thing we will know about T g is that above that glass transition temperature there is a sudden drop in the viscosity of the polymer. Many of the polymers like polystyrene and PMMA and what we are going to use, uh, they have T g in the range of 100 to 110 degree centigrade. So, at room temperatures material made out of them behave like rigid objects, they are solid. And more importantly as we will discuss atomic force microscope you will realize these are excellent candidate for performing experiments, because you can heat them up, they behave like liquids. So, they are soft now. So, you can pattern them, you can have instability with these soft films whatever and then you simply bring down that temperature. So, the structures sort of get frozen in and therefore, they are in a solid state. So, you can simply uh, analyze them using an atomic force microscope, which we will learn uh, probably as the next topic after a few classes, maybe five or six classes but you will realize that an AFM can only characterize a solid sample. So, these behave like perfect solids. And such polymers, this is something I will discuss in greater detail, such polymers can be softened in, present, uh, in presence of a solvent as well. Uh, what happens is the solvent molecules penetrate into the polymer matrix and reduce the effective TG, something I will uh, discuss. So, this is one set of one class of polymers, the glassy polymers 
and uh, you will realize that in most cases we will be talking about in many cases many of the soft lithography techniques we will be talking about patterning these polymers right and we will be actually taking advantage of uh, the glass transition temperature. In many cases, you will see that the polymers are being heated beyond their glass transition temperature, patterning is done there, and then they are sort of uh, they are either cooled or they are taken out of the solvent chamber to enhance their viscosity. So, you get structures which are stable at room temperature. So, these things will be routinely done. There is another class of polymer which uh, polymer people will call as thermoset, but let us stick to uh, the term cross link polymers. Here, the polymer chains are physically cross linked and depending on how much gap is there between these chains, this actually leads to flexible or rubbery behavior. So, yeah that is a fact that almost all the rubbers have are cross linked and since they exhibit ex excellent amount of elasticity often they are referred to or uh, this is a very simplified picture. Please do not use this term or you say that you know what is an elastomer, but Many of these cross link polymers are essentially elastomers. Uh, there are courses available on polymer physics and uh, you can look into them what exactly is an elastomer. Uh, but well uh, for all, all our purpose yeah elastomer what we will understand then one of the necessary condition is the elasticity comes from the deformation of this cross link chains. It is very simple. So, see if you try to elongate this these polymers there is no physical uh, bond or anchoring between the adjacent molecules. So, when you deform the energy you spend in deforming is not stored anywhere it is lost it is lost due to viscous dissipation. But when you have an entangled network uh, we, even if it is flexible if you now deform by applying external force part of the energy or the entire amount of energy that you that you spend in deforming remains stored within this flexible matrix as the elastic deformation energy of the material. And that is exactly why uh, you see that when you stretch a rubber and withdraw the force the rubber relaxes back to its original configuration. So, this is uh, this is achieved due to physical cross links present within the polymer matrix. So, uh, heating this polymer of course, since the chains are cross linked it cannot flow. So, there is uh, no analog of a glass transition temperature here. This statement is not fully correct the better way of putting it most of the elastomers have very low glass tra transition temperature. Like one polymer we will be talking very frequently now onward it is PDMS cross linked PDMS there is a very famous commercial product brought out by Dow Corning Silgard. 184 or even other varieties of Silgard, which is a cross link PDMS. Uh, PDMS is also very special from uh, another uh, standpoint is uh, it is a polydimethyl maybe I will spend some time on this or I will just use it here. what makes it really special it is a siloxane based polymer. Uh, so, most of the polymers you know that the backbone is a carbon 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 backbone and therefore, polymers fall into the uh, category of uh, organic uh, material, but what is there is a SiO SI uh, backbone these uh, molecules can uh, there can be four bonds with SI. So, this is uh, an example of an inorganic polymer. So, as it is PDMS uh, is liquid at room temperature because it is uh, uh, glass transition temperature is close to minus 50 or minus 60 degree centigrade, but this Silgard 184 it is a commercial product uh, I think we have the details somewhere yeah it is here this is the Silgard 184. Uh, it is in fact it comes it is it is a cross linkable PDMS and it comes in two parts. The part A is called the oligomer the main polymer and uh, you can search the net with Silgard 184 
you can get the data sheet and you can get all other details about it and the part B is cross linker. So, what is typically done is some proportion of part B is mixed into the part A, it can be 5 to 10 percent or 15 percent and then thermally heated. So, at the, as you thermally heat what happens is bonds form between adjacent chains. So, these bonds form and it forms this type of a cross linked network as we were talking about. In fact, one can very carefully notice that in fact, the unlike carbon because of its uh, structure silicon needs an oxygen between that there, there has to be an oxygen molecule present between two adjacent silicon and therefore, the gap the silicon silicon gap is more which in fact, provides more flexibility to silicon. So, therefore, this is one of the excellent candidates all that is done is it comes as a liquid you mix it at a room temperature and cure it or anneal it uh, for some time at elevated temperature, temperature typically of 100 to 120 degree centigrade for 4 to 6 hours, people some people cure it for longer duration and from a liquid it transforms to an elastic solid. So, this type of a material falls into the second category of polymer which is a cross linked uh, polymer uh, and it, it actually has a rubbery filling uh, uh, and uh, as we will see in the subsequent lectures this is very, very this particular material is extremely important in the context of soft lithography. Now, uh, if you expose this to its solvent vapor this material again does not flow like a uh, glassy polymer, but it sort of swells and that is another advantage one can take in control in the dimension of the block or whatever. So, with this brief introduction we are now uh, in a position to take up uh, soft lithography or discuss soft lithography in some bit detail and from the next class I will uh, start from classifying the soft lithography techniques which itself is an important topic and you need to understand based on what methodology you are going to uh, classify and there are different methodologies, different thought uh, either the type of patterns you are creating can be one of the criteria or the nature of the stamp or the mold you are using can be one of the criteria or the type of force you are using can be one of the criteria, we will start from there. Thank you.